Storygram Network. Hosting for this podcast is generously provided by Transistor at Transistor.fm. Hi, my name is Laura Lee, and this is It's Not About Food. So it's not about food, and it's not about weight. What is it about? Everything else. Because it's never, ever about food or weight. Never, ever. Not even. One time. Not ever. Ever, ever. Hello, everyone. This is Laura Lee Rourke from It's Not About Food podcast. So happy that you joined us today. And this is a really great thing to talk about at this time, which is called awareness. So the goddess is holding a candle in the dark, and it's a little bit of a circle of light around that. And she's looking at the candle. So is the deer. And uh, they're just looking at awareness, I think, being aware that it was dark and now it's light. So the back of the card reads, awareness is awakening to ourselves exactly as we are in the present moment. In order to heal our struggle with food and weight, we must become aware of eating patterns, emotions, bodily sensations, and diet and fat thoughts. Only by watching and working with ourselves in the moment can we truly understand what we need. And to me, this was a huge part of my own recovery of in the moment asking myself what I needed, in the moment being a witness to my own thoughts and behaviors, and in the moment changing that if it needed to be changed. But I needed to know the present moment And that was very hard for me because I lived in the future will be better. The past was pretty awful. And I didn't want to live in the present because I had no idea what was going on usually. You know, I just wanted to always be into this future time when I was going to be really thin or I was going to be really rich or I'm going to be really a better person and have an all new everything, top to bottom. I felt it was a mistake that I was where I was and I needed to be better all the time, perfect. So I was really happy to, at some point, think or come up with the idea, if you will, that no, it's this moment that you're present in. Now, what if you're just here now? Like my old friend Ram Das used to say, be here now. And I thought that was a great idea. <laughs> But I didn't at all know how to do it. I thought that it was be here now, was be there now with him. But when he left, I didn't have to be there now anymore. (laughs) So it was a really weird thing. I had delayed reactions and it was very hard for me to stay in the present moment. But I've learned how to do it. And I think this is something that my next guest is very good at, is staying in the present moment. And I known her for a long while, and I've seen her have to be present in the exact moment she was in. And it's a beautiful thing to witness somebody else doing that too. So it makes it maybe a little bit easier when I have to do it to think about her that she can do it. So anyway, I'm going to introduce Margaret, and she's going to tell us what she's up to, what she's doing in her life, and how she works with awareness. So hello, Margaret. Hello. Thanks for having me. So what am I up to in my life? (laughs) And how do I work with awareness? I think it's interesting you mentioned how before you were often ahead or behind and not really in the moment. And that's something I have in common with you and probably a lot of other people. And I was often feeling bad about the past or it was definitely a fantasizing and somewhere else not dealing with now at all. And I think that <laughs> when you were talking about it, I ended up sort of laughing because I do think I've become better about living in the moment. 
And I think that there's parts of myself that are really enriched by living in the moment, whether it's outside or a breath of fresh air or sometimes appreciating a rose as I walk in a door or something. But the other thing I thought of was when I think of those struggles, it was very, very intense when I was in college and I was in college for a long time, actually. So it was in intense while I was in college, which was over 10 years. And what I find interesting is I'm 60, I'm going to be 62 this week. And often something that I remind myself is this could be as good as it gets. This is as good as it gets. (laughs) This is as good as it's been. And I don't know, I'm not so tempted to fantasize about the future. I don't know that I'm afraid of the future. But anyway, I just wonder if at certain points in people's lives of development, if if they quit kind of fantasizing about the future because they're so old. (laughs) I think they do. I have elders in my life before that have now maybe passed on, but I love that this might be as good as it gets. And for sure it is because we're just going to get older from here if we're lucky enough to live another day. You know, things are going to fall apart or shift and change or do whatever they do as a little human body. So I love that. This is as good as it gets here. So, <laughs> and yeah. And also just appreciating like one thing I've learned over time is how before I was, you know, very self critical about images of myself or also just in my own body, I was uncomfortable and self critical of my body and the way I perceived it looked. But then I realized a number of years ago, now what I thought was bad in my 20s when I was in my 40s, that was pretty great, right? (laughs) So so I've had enough experience with that. One of the things is, is I just try to live from the inside out. Just being present, I think some of that is awareness. What does that mean to you, inside out? From the deep inside out to the world? It means instead of like looking at myself from the outside, even images, it's not that I don't look at images or that I don't have a mirror, but I think I spend more time self embodied in my body and experiencing myself here now instead of basing it on being a an external looking at myself. It's more of a feeling tone. And I'm lucky too, is sometimes I have periods of pain, but of course it's a lot easier when you're not in pain. (laughs) Yes, it is. (laughs) You're not actively in pain. (laughs) So, but I do think like living the inside out. So for me, Uh, One thing that helps me do that is walking outside, feeling the air on my skin. I do like physical movement. I tend to respond positively to it. So I like to swim in cold water. And there's something about the sensation of the cold water on my skin. And even when I leave the cold water, I still, if it's a hot day, I can still just touch in with that coldness I was immersed in. Anyway, but that experience helps me feel the edges of my body and my flesh and everything. And then the body sensation is kind of strong. Yeah. And I would think that would make you extremely aware of all parts of your body, of your skin on your face and on your body and between your toes and in your hair. That's pretty real when you jump into cold water lakes, you know. (laughs) And I have a really wonderful memory of you actually doing that. I asked you to take me on parts of the Pacific Crest Trail for one of my birthday things. And you put a thing together with some other women. And we were by a lake at some point. We were making dinner, I think, at that time. It was after a walk and a hike. And so... You just, without any self, I don't know, shame or just matter of factly, went to the water's edge, took off your clothes, put them right down on the little shore and walked into the lake. (laughs) No one else did that. 
<laughs> no one. Not even the dogs. <laughs> and you were so happy. You swam out for a while and you turned around, a big grin on your face. Does anybody want to come? And everybody was just, no, not at all. <laughs> But what I just loved about that was something that you really loved to do and you did it and you didn't care who was there or who wasn't there. And this was your body, your lake, your water, your self. I just loved it so much. I've had that image in my head of somebody who just, I'm doing this. This is what I'm doing and I don't care what you guys do. <laughs> So thank you for that wonderful image that I keep with me. Somebody truly just letting herself do what her body's asking her to do. Yeah, it's kind of a, I don't know, it's an embodying experience. It's kind of spiritual in a way to do something that helps you feel your body. For me anyway, I don't know that it's that way for everybody. No, I could completely see that. Uh, There was a part of me that was, I could do that too, but I would never do it because I don't like to get in lakes. I think there might be a sea creature in there that would get me. (laughs) I just, if I can't see my feet, then I'm worried about it, you know, so. Yeah, it's not everybody's cup of tea. The creature from the Black Lagoon ruined me for my whole life of being in water. I can't see my feet in. (laughs) Anyway. So tell me, what do you do in the world other than jump into lakes? (laughs) That's what I was going to say is that right now, recently, I feel like I am working. I take older people on tours, on the road tours, and I'm starting that again. And I do work in fitness. I'm a senior personal trainer, a fitness trainer for older people or people with disabilities. And all of that work was shut down during COVID. And that's starting back up. But I feel like I'm learning how to live in this part of the post-COVID world and period of life. I actually really had a lot of benefits from the period of time when COVID shut everything down. One of them is my daughter came home and ended up, she wasn't going to stay home, but she stayed home for a while. And that ended up being a really good experience because before, when she lived at home, it was before she went to college. So I was her mom and I felt a responsibility to play a certain type of role as mother. And then she went to college and she came home and ended up staying here. But I didn't have the same level of responsibility around that. You know, I didn't have to feel like I had to direct her ship or something. <laughs> yes. <laughs> and there was just because of COVID, other than taking care of our well-being, there wasn't a lot of striving. There wasn't a lot of external needs. And actually, I think that then I got to sink in and be maybe not a mentor, but live my life in a way that I got to be a different type of mother or a different type of example. Anyway, I've always had a garden. I have a community garden. And as soon as things shut down with COVID, it was March or something, March or April, and I planted the garden early because I was thinking of maybe supply chains are going to get messed up or something like that. So the whole time and still, but you know, it's not all of our food comes from the garden, but my relationship with the garden, I think is something that she's been able to sort of live with me. You know, she hasn't taken over the garden, but I think it's something that she's been able to value. And I think that the non-striving, there's a lot of elements of the way I live my life that it's turned out that I think she really values. Yeah, it's sort of like covid But also you taught her that principle of chop wood, carry water, that sort of meditative 
just do the next right thing. And so it makes sense, you know, we're in a world pandemic. Let's make sure we have food. (laughs) You know, we don't know what's going to happen. And she was just right there along with you learning that as well. It was a beautiful story. Yeah. And those basics are what kind of helped me stay grounded. There's a lot of value to those everyday things. Definitely. And do you find that your clientele, the seniors that you work with and take them on trips, how are they with awareness? Are they staying in the moment with their old age and creaky knees and whatever happens with them? And, you know, how is that with them? I think, you know, different people are different. However, this is my theory that a lot of people, because I studied as a wellness coach, and that program had a lot of goals. It was based on setting goals and that you didn't have to 100% do your goal. Even if you did 60, 60% or 70%, you were moving in that direction and looking at what motivates you and things like that. I think there's value in that. But what I have found about working with older people is a lot of people aren't really motivated by goals. They're not really interested in goals. And there are some, I have one woman who still actually leads tours to Israel, even though she has disabilities. But a lot of people, but like that equation or that theory of being motivated by setting goals is not something that interests a lot of people that are older. It's more living. Yeah, it's living one more day. <laughs> the goal yeah. is to make it to dinner. <laughs> <laughs> or, yeah. or to try to, you know, manage yourself so you're not in as much pain. Yes. You know, maybe it's movement. Maybe and for some people, it really is swimming can save their life if they could do that during that time of all that shutdown. Connecting with others, having meals with people you enjoy. One thing that's really come up, I think, that I've seen is appreciating caregivers and people that are helping you because there really is a shortage. Storygram Network. Welcome to One Media, One Media. I. When you're whining with nurses. It's a place I like to call The Bleed. My name is Laura Lee, and this is It's Not About Food. The art of being yay isn't just something he developed. Storygram Network. Yeah. So if you get one that really does a good job, it's really important to appreciate that. Right. I read the awareness card and I wanted to just say that I think it would benefit me to be more aware of of when I'm hungry and when I'm full. I, I look at that a bit. Sometimes I notice myself craving just like wanting to eat food and like being in a place where knowing that I can understand wanting a taste sensation. However, I'm not hungry and there's no food that's really going to fix this or make me feel better. So it's easier to let it go when I'm really noticing that I'm really feeling discontent. And that's the awareness part is to be aware that the signal for let's eat something isn't always because you're hungry, because you're sad or you're too busy or you're tired, whatever the feeling is. It's really great that you see that. Then you can match it. And sometimes there's nothing to do. Just, oh, isn't that interesting? I got hungry for something and now I'm not because I know I'm not. Okay, just go on. (laughs) Yeah, just noticing it often resolves it. To me, that's really answering your own call so much better than just doing whatever the thing is that we think of. You know, if we really think about, well, what do I truly want? That is so much, I may not like the answer. (laughs) Like, I don't want to live here anymore. (laughs) Or, you know, I don't want to, whatever. It's not always easy, the answer. 
but it is important to hear it, to hear ourselves say it. What is my awareness of what I need and want and how to take care of myself is a really wonderful question. Yes. And then sometimes there's parts of this. Well, I have to just admit, I think I've been doing this nine years and I probably honestly would at the beginning would hope that there would have been a different outcome. You'd be a a different person, a different looking person. Yeah, yeah, yeah. I'd be smaller, right? I'd be smaller. but And I'm really grateful that I'm just, you know, relatively that I'm healthy and comfortable in my body. And one of the things that helps that is actually, so I don't have this yo-yo thing happening in size. And I think it's also, it's less emotional yo-yo. Here's a perfect example. So in May, I had the first tour I'd had in three years. Wow. And when I do those tours, it's dress casual business casual, I guess, or something, you know, I can be relatively casual, but I like to look good enough that my clients want to be with me. (laughs) And it helps if it's somehow colorful enough that it stands out a little bit so they can see me, right? Right. Often one of my refrains in life, if I'm uncomfortable, can be that I won't have anything to wear, you know, that I, I don't, look that I look fat or that I nothing will fit you and nothing will fit me and that I won't look good and be uncomfortable um, yeah that whole refrain however since I have been accepting myself more I haven't yo-yoed as much so I'm sure it came up a little bit like wondering what I would wear and then after three years I went and I had clothes. I had I could still wear my clothes. Of course. And they still look good. And there are colors that have changed or something. But that was such a relief. And I think that if I was from past experience, I think if I was more caught up with my body and my image, and if I was losing weight and then gaining weight and losing weight, that I wouldn't have necessarily had so many choices of what to wear. No, and you wouldn't have known. You know, I would be afraid to try something on because I was afraid it wouldn't fit. So I just wouldn't. I'd go buy something else. That's such a good point about that. And I think a lot of people found that through the pandemic that I could actually wear my clothes that I had before, you know, (laughs) because I didn't, I don't know, get really big or really small. I just sort of stayed the same with whatever. I got older, got two years older. (laughs) But good for you. Good for you about that. And did that make you feel good or how did that make you feel? I think it was comforting, at least neutral. It might have helped confidence, too. It was great, but it was a good feeling. It was uplifting. It was just one less thing to worry about. And also for me, when those thoughts come up, when they start to come up, it's almost like they're like, an old friend, like I'm familiar with them, you know, oh, here you are again. And it helps to just be aware that they're there, you know, or how they're affecting things. But what I find is that I have enough experience to know that when they come up, they're just a sign and exhibiting that I'm worried about something else, that there's something else happening. And that They're like the forerunner or something. I love that so much. And tell me, do you notice, you know, I'm just sort of wondering, because I do know that you do these tours with the seniors, with older people. Are they more in the moment than your age group or my age group? Well, I would be one of those seniors too, I guess. But (laughs) um, it seems to me... Watching my grandfather an awfully long time ago, it took him a long time to fill his pipe. And then it took a long time to get the match to start to burn the tobacco in the pipe. And then it felt like it took forever for him to smoke that one pipe outside. And 
he would just sit on a bench, we called it daddy's bench, and just sit there for a really long time. And I remember thinking, when I get old, I'm going to have time to do that. You know, and I could have been like eight, <laughs> like I didn't have time. <laughs> but I couldn't sit that long. It didn't feel like I could. Do you see that with them? For me, creating a positive experience, travel experience with them, is that I need to not build in so many things that they're rushing. And in order to get an interesting winery in, it's not worth bypassing an hour of rest in the afternoon. Oh my God, it's such a great lesson, isn't it? For all of us. Yeah, it's really easy in our culture. It's permeated everything about, you know, in a hurry. It's like a merit badge or something of I'm really busy. I have a lot to do. (laughs) And I have a perspective on that lately because I work with a lot of older people. So we're talking late 80s, 90s. Actually, on my last tour, I had a man who turned 100 the next week, 100 years old. Oh, my gosh. Yeah. And (laughs) uh, it's like, where are we rushing? Why are we rushing? Where are we rushing to? I mean, we're all going to end up in the same place anyway in the end. And do we really want to rush or feel like we're rushing to get there? Anyway, it's an interesting concept. And yeah, you can't really rush my people because they do move slower. And my main objective is that they have a good time and that they're safe. So I just try to set things up so that it's successful. And I've been doing it 10 years and people are still coming back that started touring in their 80s. So I think it has been pretty successful. So great. Yeah. Yeah. And I love that. It seems like, you know, maybe the older you get, the less you want to rush. And it's like the younger you are, the less you want to rush. I mean, I can remember walking my granddaughter and she needed to stop the walk and bend down and look at an ant. (laughs) for a really long time. <laughs> and I was like, and I had a schedule. I need to get to the playground. You need to play. Then we need to get home and we need to make dinner. So that's what we've got going. But to her, the whole thing was play, whether she got to the playground or not. This was what she was doing, looking at the sand. And I had to just set my own timer to her when I watched her. Right. And it sounds like, and there was a level of awareness. She's stopping and am I going to grab her and just drag her along or are we going to experience this together? I had that happen. It's been slow in coming. It was harder for me before. The other day I was at the beach and I had my dog and I was at Stinson and I like to walk all the way out and I like to walk around the bend because I enjoy the Bolinas Lagoon a lot. So that's my goal to get around there and enjoy the hills for the Bolinas Lagoon. There was no wind. It was fabulous. My dog decided about two thirds of the way out there that he just needed to stop and dig a hole for his ball. (laughs) (laughs) He really didn't want to walk anymore. He didn't lie down and go on strike that way, but he dropped his ball and then he just started digging holes. Somehow to how I did manipulate it. So I got him to go a little further. But when he did it again, it was just like, it's okay. And, and so that is, that's been a process for me to be able to let go of my goal. I don't know if I was ever really great at goals, to tell you the truth. Anyway, I think I didn't even set them because I was afraid of not having them or not meeting them, you know, and then it would feed into my self-esteem, negative self-esteem. So it's been hard to learn to give up goals. I still have them sometimes, but I'm can be a lot more gracious about not getting the 10,000 steps. I try for 10,000 steps, but, (laughs) but to be able to if it's not 10,000 that day or to move still, I like a variety. I think a variety is important. And I, I think an organicness from day to day of different things, just like, you know, different foods are supposed to be helpful. 
But anyway, with a kid or with the dog or with my husband or whoever, to not have to be like my agenda or it's a failure or I'm dissatisfied or I'm not complete. That is so beautiful. It's really wonderful. And think maybe that hopefully comes with age that we start to let go of what we thought was important and instead just be in the moment wherever we are. That sounds to me like Taddy, your dog, was in the moment. (laughs) He didn't have the same goal that you did, which was to get... To the Bellinas Lagoon, he's like, well, what's wrong with this right here? <laughs> <laughs> There's plenty of sand. <laughs> There's plenty of water right here, I see. I think we really need to dig now. <laughs> <laughs> right, right. Yeah. So I wonder if you'll read that last part of the card that today I will practice. Today, I will practice becoming aware of one of the following. When I'm hungry, what I'm hungry for, and when I'm full, feelings that I'm having when I'm eating or worry about my weight, or how many times throughout the day I have diet or food thoughts. I will do this with compassion. Mm -hmm. You have to bring that compassion piece in if we're going to ask those questions, for sure. And if I was to focus on one I think for me, it'd be what I'm hungry for. And that can be so much more than food. There's so many different answers for that one. I really appreciate you coming on my little podcast and just love seeing you, even though it's over Zoom, but really appreciate you coming on. Do you have a website? How do people get in touch with you if they want to be one of your seniors or they got parents they want their parents to go to be a senior on your trip i have a website and the website address is i make fitness fun it's not an updated website but i do have a website okay and i don't know if i'll modernize it or not i've been considering modernizing it but (laughs) Uh, word of mouth is good. I don't know if you feel comfortable with it, Loralee, but yeah. they can all, a person can contact you and you can of course. Um, put them in touch with me. Sure. And I do have a email, but I just work for myself and the name of my company is just Margaret Wallace Recreation Therapy. I'm a recreation therapist and I do really very much believe in Functional wellness is my deal. Yeah. And so it's the whole body and people's interests. And it's about quality of life and living the best life you can with whatever your circumstances are. That's right. And being aware of what they are and being aware of where you want to go. This is beautiful. So great. We're talking about doing a Pasadena Palm Springs tour in the beginning of April. And then I do have a tour going out the first week of June in 2023. And we'll be going to Sequoia National Park and Kings Canyon. I have a work husband (laughs) who has a company, Mm -hmm. Bay Magic Tours. And so I work with David Rubens of Bay Magic Tours and we put these tours together. The other thing is, is I do have a great awareness of travel and working with people with different types of mobility limitations or abilities. And so just to let you know, if there's anyone who even wants a family reunion or a family trip, I have had people want to put together a trip when they were having a family gathering and we did that for them. Yep. That's exactly what you did for me. You put together this trip on the trail. That's right. We did that. Back. We did. And then uh, we also had a, some practice runs <laughs> before then. Yeah, and we did training. Training yeah. really important. It was so And then good. on that trip, some people camped, some people didn't, you know, stayed in their car. So that would be made me. it work for different people. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. I blamed it on my old dog, but really it was me. Some people brought their dogs, some <laughs> yeah. people didn't. Yeah. And we'll see what happens. I haven't put together a a backpacking thing or a 
with the fires and the climate yeah, change, it's been harder to plan for things like that. But this year has been a good year. So I think if I was to say if I had any strengths, I guess I think that it's resourceful with what life is presenting of itself right now. That is so great. I'm so glad that I know you and I'm so glad you were on and I'm really grateful that you were here today. Thank you for being here and we'll keep in touch. Thank you for listening and be sure and follow me on Patreon, Instagram, Twitter, Facebook, and it's not about food.com. Thanks.